Well, hello, everybody. You've made it to the end of the day. Congratulations. Uh, I am here to talk about responsive web applications uh, with container queries. Uh, so the reason why I'm kind of I, um, talking about applications specifically is because I feel like they have a, a different use case than a lot of uh, websites. Uh, so, you know, why do we need container queries? Well, if we look at what, let's say, a lot of marketing sites have, um, things are often considered based on the entire uh, viewport. In other words, from one edge of the screen to another. Um, as we resize down, well, we say, OK, that top navigation should resize a particular way. That hero image with that copy and that button, that call to action, should behave a certain way. Uh, below that, we had three boxes. And we, you know, from edge to edge, we're going to instead stack those. And this is a pretty common pattern that we see through uh, a lot of designs. Uh, Clear Left's website, very similar. They've got the top bar. They've got that hero with the call to action. And as we resize down, they treat each one as this individual piece from edge to edge. I mean, the .css website itself um, is no exception. Uh, again, we've got that top navigation with the logo. We've got the hero image with the call to action. Uh, we've got uh, the speaker list below. And as we resize down, each of those is considered as sort of its own cohesive piece. That top bar where that navigation collapses into a hamburger menu. We have that uh, hero image that is sized down. The copy has realigned itself. Um, and then the, the speaker lineup is now stacked um, instead of uh, beside each other. And when we do sort of look at a web application, uh, one such application that I worked on was the Shopify admin, uh, we have a lot of complexity um, in our interface. Um, you know, a marketing site is often sort of one and done. We build the site, and then we move on to the next thing. Uh, web applications are very dynamic. Uh, so this particular page was the order page. This one particular page has a number of considerations that we had to worry about uh, when it came to uh, our design and development. So for example, I needed to worry about whether or not there were no orders at all. What does that page look like? Do we uh, just have simply a blank page? That would probably not look very ideal. Uh, maybe we need to show some sort of graphic or help text to help the user along. Uh, what if they only have one order? You know, do I worry about pagination? No, probably not. I've only got the one order. Um, you know, how do I help them get more? Um, but you know, I'm still dealing with less than a page of orders. I might have 20, or maybe I've now got multiple pages of orders. How you know? Now I'm dealing with pagination. Where does that show up in my interface? What does that look like? Um, maybe I have info notifications, things that I need to let the user uh, know about. Hey, you've got 20 orders that you haven't fulfilled yet. Maybe you should do that. Uh, there was uh, tabs and the ability to add more tabs. Now I have to deal with what do I do with uh, when I have too many tabs, especially on smaller screens. Warning notifications uh, and so on. You know, limited access to features. Um, if people have different apps installed, all of this plays into how that one particular page looks and feels. OK, now that we've taken all that into consideration, let's figure out how to do all of these things for all the different viewports that we care about. Right? You know, do we care about phone? Do we care about tablet? Do we care about desktop? Do we care about uh, you know, super large screens? And as you can see, the, there is a lot of complexity. And so you know, if we have that ability to kind of think of things in a more sort of componentized way. A uh, good example of that was this particular uh, chart uh, where we've got, so OK, we've got two things that we want to demonstrate. Uh, one was talking about sales, the other's about visitors. Uh, and there's sort of two components inside of that. One was the table, and the other one was the graph. But on some screens, we didn't have that much data. Um, so in this case, we only had one graph. Um, it was only the sales that we wanted to, to show here. Um, and just showing it on half the screen probably didn't make sense. We had a full screen to play with, uh, but having a lot of sort of dead space didn't make a lot of sense. We needed to rearrange these items. Um, and that, uh, uh, when it comes to you know, using media queries to solve this problem, you have to know the interplay of all the objects under all scenarios. So that sort of, you know, I want the graph on the, the, the right and the table on the left in some cases, but in other cases, I want them stacked. 
um, using media queries, I now have to know, okay, well, do I have two columns? Or maybe I have three columns. Maybe I have just one column. Under which scenario do I have to worry about these things? Likewise, what if I have one column that's bigger than another? So in the right-hand column, I want it to be sized a specific way. Uh, and in another scenario, I want it sized some other way. Uh, so obviously, as you can see, uh, you know, being able to use container queries would be a, a really fantastic way of doing this. In other words, you know, if we can only have to worry about the interplay um, within a single object, we can design that object to be standalone, and then just based on the space it has, style things. So let's look at the CSS spec for container queries. Sorry, one does not exist. I might look at you, Daniel. I would love to have one of these things. Uh, so because the spec doesn't actually exist, what do we do? Well, we need to declare uh, these queries in uh, one of three ways. So we can declare them in our CSS, we can declare them in our HTML, or in our JavaScript. Well, I know as a CSS developer, the place that I would like to see those uh, would be in the CSS. Um, and there are a number of uh, JavaScript libraries out there that try to create uh, element queries, the idea of creating this contextual styling. Uh, and every library is going to have its own syntax because uh, you know, the, a spec doesn't exist. And so we can declare this stuff in our CSS. Um, but one of the problems that we ran into at Shopify was that to parse this CSS, um, that uh, style sheet needs to be on the same domain as our JavaScript, or we needed to be able to set up a cross-origin cross um, uh, header to say that these requests are OK. And when we looked at our implementation, we looked at how quickly we needed to roll this out, talk to our content delivery networks, and we realized, you know what, setting up all the course headers was going to be too much for us we're not going to be able to do this in CSS. So alternatively, we could declare this in the HTML. In other words, we on our HTML uh, elements, we use an attribute, and we define what our breakpoints are in there on each individual element. Again, one of the other problems that we ran into was that HTML requires consistency across an application. Now, there are ways of doing that. Um, for example, a lot of design systems essentially build an API for their components. Uh, so a developer can consume that API and render consistent HTML throughout their application. Uh, now at the time when I was at Shopify, uh, they were very early on in this process of building a design system. We did not have an API. When a developer was working on a new section of the website, their te technique was to copy and paste from one section to another, and errors would show up. So we realized, you know what, HTML isn't the place for this either. So we went to JavaScript. And in JavaScript, all we had to do was declare an array of elements. In other words, what are the components that we want to make uh, to react to the space that they had available? So we would declare the, the module name, which was just simply a CSS selector, uh, generally a single class selector um, for that element. We'd specify the class name that would be applied to that, and then we'd specify its constraints. And for us, the only constraint that we cared about was width. In fact, if you're looking for a container query JavaScript library, most of the ones out there um, are almost exclusively to width, although some out there do some uh, really sort of fantastic, interesting things uh, with their container queries. So uh, some of you might be thinking, well, you know, this is great that a lot of developers are kind of heading down this path of using container queries, but why haven't browser developers actually uh, implemented this in their browsers? And probably the uh, example that is often given is a sort of circular reference problem uh, that can easily come up. So in this uh, sort of made up syntax, again, because the syntax doesn't exist, we're going to say if the element uh, is at a minimum 500 pixels wide, I now want its style to be 400 pixels wide. So you can probably see, well, if it's 400 pixels wide, it's no longer a minimum of 500. Therefore, this CSS no longer applies. Well, if the CSS no longer applies, then my element is now above 500 pixels, at which point the CSS applies, and we get into this circular loop. 
Now, uh, there are a number of different ways that maybe we can solve this, um, you know, where we could say only limit the sort of number of loops that we do to uh, one or two times, um, or you know, some other sort of constraint system that we can implement. But uh, one of the other problems that we run into is also the uh, browser pipeline and how it actually figures out what styles to apply on a particular element. So anytime uh, the browser loads up the CSS, um, it's going to essentially create this map to say, I can apply these properties to these elements. Now, the interesting thing about this is that if you imagine I've set a width to 50%, uh, on a particular element. The browser at this point doesn't actually know what the computed width of that's going to be. It's not going to know that until it hits the layout step. So if you have a media query that says, hey, uh, or a, sorry, rather a container query, if you have a container query that says, I need to style this element based on its width, it hasn't figured that out yet. And so we actually run into a situation where you know, I've declared the width to be something but the browser doesn't know what the minimum width is yet until it goes to the layout phase. Now, again, browsers could implement this in such a way that, okay, well, once I'm finished the layout phase, maybe I go back to the style phase to see if there's any other styles that I can apply, re-layout the page, go back to the style, is there anything else I can apply, go back to the layout phase. And you can see we kind of get into the situation where the browser has to do a heck of a lot more work um, often relaying out the page, reflowing multiple times in order to actually render. So not necessarily ideal. So what do we have coming down the pipe that we might be able to use um, as developers that want the power of container queries uh, without necessarily the technology at our fingertips? Well, there's a couple things. One is Resize Observer. So Resize Observer is a JavaScript API that allows us to essentially say, this element on my page, whenever it resizes, let me know. Um, and this is a little bit easier than, uh, and a heck of a lot faster than saying, when the browser resizes, go through all the elements that I care about and see if they've changed. Um, and so we get a much more performant, a faster way of interacting uh, and resizing uh, and responding to resize uh, within our events. The other thing uh, that is sounds pretty exciting, is Houdini. Now, Houdini is a combination of things. Uh, we get a layout API, a uh, custom paint API, parser, properties and values. There's a whole bunch of different things that we get access to um, that get us closer to uh, the browser rendering engine. Now, is Houdini ready yet? Unfortunately, browser support right now is pretty minimal, especially when you consider um, so Chrome is really the only one at this point that has implemented anything substantial. Um, we don't have layout API, but we do have custom paint. We don't have parser, but we do have properties and values and a couple other things. But when we think about what we need for developing a thing that responds to layout, we need two specific things. We need to come up with a specification for container queries. So we need a parser API. We don't have that yet. Um, and we need a layout API, and we don't have that yet. And even with those two things, even once we get that, we still have the problem of the, uh, whether or not you know, the, the style and layout phases of the browser are going to work well from a JavaScript perspective versus a CSS perspective. So you know, it might seem kind of doom and gloom at this point, but I think there are some things that we can look forward to. And that is the fact that browsers today um, actually have some pretty cool stuff available to us. So when we look at what's happening here, I've got a two-column design, uh, you know, a larger left column versus a right-hand column. And as I resize the browser down, that right-hand column moves under the other one and is now a full width. And this happens uh, through Flexbox. Um, Flexbox gives us that power right now to respond based on the width of its container. Um, so I could have this Flexbox in a much wider uh, UI, and those two columns will resize down based on the space that I have available. Uh, so we simply say, 
you know, I've got, declare my flex basis where I've got 66 and 33%, but I'm gonna set this minimum width. Once my main column uh, hits that minimum 360 pixels, then the right-hand column is gonna flow down using flex wrap. I'm gonna say, you know, wrap my elements when I have, uh, don't have enough room on one line, and I get the design that I want. Another example of this. Uh, I have a, um, a card with actions on the right-hand side, and as I resize that down, because of the sort of horizontal stuff, I got too much on one line, I wanna move those actions down onto uh, the next line. But I no longer want them anchored over to the right-hand side, I want them lined up with my content. And again, this is something that we could do today. We have power uh, with Flexbox, again, uh, to do this. So, um, I've got uh, sort of using uh, this sort of object where I've got my actions off to the right-hand side, uh, my content on the left, and as I resize down, uh, again, relying on flex wrap, uh, I simply say, okay, this is my minimum space. Once I don't have enough space, move those elements down and it will automatically uh, align properly. Another trick that we can do is, is we can start combining flex and grid together. Uh, so in this uh, example here, I have a, uh, a three column layout, which as you might have noticed, as I resized down, suddenly became a two column layout. And as I resized down again, became a one column layout. But on top of that, inside of each uh, sort of cell, we had this image and this text together, where the image was on the left-hand side when I have enough space, and when I didn't, it would move the image up on top. And so now we've got this very flexible interface that as I resize down, it moves these elements around for me. Uh, and this is a great way of combining, again, the technologies that we have available without needing to use media queries or anything else. So I've declared my, uh, my box, it's got the image, and the content, so this is the thing that's displaying the image on the top or on the side. And again, I'm using flex wrap. Uh, but one of the other things that I've added in here is object fit. So what object fit does is it takes that image and despite the fact that it's resized it out, isn't skewing the image, it isn't stretching the image, it's actually cropping the image uh, to fit in that space. Um, so we have that flexibility of being able to do that without really complex uh, sort of CSS that we need to do that. And then everything else, uh, we can still rely on, um, on the usual flex, grow, and shrink. And then the items themselves, we use display grid. And with the display grid, we use repeat. So what repeat does is it allows us to auto fit based on a constraint. And I said my minimum cell should be 400 pixels. Um, otherwise, it should take one fractional unit. So if I've got enough space for three items, each one should take an equal third. If I've only got space for two items, each one will take an equal half. Uh, and then once uh, it can't fit, it will resize those items down. So hopefully one day we will get container queries. I think it will give us a lot of power. Um, until then, let's use grid, let's use flex. Uh, and thank you very much, I appreciate it.